Hey everyone, welcome back to Real Talk NFT, where we talk all things Web3. I'm very excited today to have on Benjamin Charbit, who's the CEO of Life Beyond Studios, a gaming publisher under the Animoca umbrella. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you so much. How are you guys? Uh, yeah, this is great. Um, I know that you're over there in Paris right now. I'm in California. A little bit of time difference, but we're going to make The metaverse, work. man. This is the metaverse, you know? <laughs> we're in the same room right now, you and I. Yes, yeah, de- totally. Yeah, just not the avatars yet. Uh, coming soon. Uh, Absolutely. Soon to be on, on the Apple, you know, the, the goggles that just released, right? <laughs> oh, please don't hype me up. I'm already I'm already uh, the, oh, close to the moon right now. Oh, you're on the wait list trying to buy one, huh? <laughs> you, have no, you have no idea. Well, I'm sure we're going to wow. talk about it because... It, it means so much to me. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely dive into a little bit about that. But before that, you have a vast experience in gaming, and so does your team. You know, tell us how you know your bad, little bit of background and how you came about to discover Life Beyond Studios. So I'm uh, I'm one of the very lucky individuals who got to break into this fantastic industry, the games industry, uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, a couple of years. <laughs> I'm too kind to my on my to myself. It's been uh, it's been a few uh, several years now. I actually started my career as an investment banker, so nothing related to this, uh, mm. because you know finding your way in this industry was really difficult back then. Uh, but I was always a like a passionate gamer, um, and I was even an esport player at the beginning of esport mm. in France. So. Um, wow. Finally managed to find my way there. It's a long story, but uh, uh, actually a funny one. I met the CEO of Ubisoft when I was still a banker. Told him a little bit about my past, and he was like, "What are you doing in banking? Join us!" <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and I eventually joined the team. Did a bunch of things over there, um, and Ubisoft was such uh, an open-minded company that I got to eventually cut my teeth. Uh, into AAA game development. So first, I really focused on working closely uh, um, on online services, online game content. You know, when I was really trying to, uh, I was the head of strategy for that division. So we were trying to mm-hmm. build up from the ground up this new practice at Ubisoft, game as a service, uh, you know, online connected experiences. When Ubisoft was a very traditional house, building single player story driven games we learned a lot through this process and eventually i was offered to join the assassin's creed team to bring wow. kind of all this know-how to uh, the team where i became monetization and game director uh, on assassin's creed black flag uh, fantastic experience and then eventually kept working on the assassin's creed franchise uh, as a game and creative director uh, helping a few projects working on our own project as well um, and you know one thing led to another um, i just thought it was the time uh, for for me to start my own venture considering that i became obsessed with the metaverse in 2014 uh, mm-hmm. I read my first book of Neil Stephenson. Uh, that was not Snow Crash; it was uh, Rim D. And this is when I was like, "Wow, um, mm-hmm. this is the thing that I've been fantasizing about for my whole life, being someone else in a digital space where I could just have a new life, a new existence." Uh, so I just I decided to do this. But can you imagine what it was pitching the metaverse in like? <laughs> between 2014 to uh, 2017, 2018, took, it was uh, it was not an easy thing, and so that's what eventually led to the birth of the of Life Beyond Studios, which was originally named Darewise Entertainment. Wow! So wow, you had a interesting journey into Web three, and you were an esports professional, well, professional or or amateur. I, I'm not sure what it was, uh, but which game was no, it? Was it, I mean, was it Counter feet? Strike? Counter Strike. Oh, Counter Strike. Uh, okay. Listen, I mean. Uh, <laughs> It's hard to call it professional when you're in 2000s because, uh, you know, it's it's really the very beginning of, you know, price pools that are significant. Like, it was, we had some sponsorship, and I played with, like, mm-hmm. the French national team. I played, played with the GGs. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I mean, with those really legit teams that are big today, uh, I mean, I'm not very connected with the esports anymore, so I don't even know if they exist today. But a few years ago, they were <laughs> still in, this, in the scene. But... That wasn't really an op. Like it, it didn't feel like, oh, I'm gonna make a career out mm-hmm. of it, you know. So I went to college, studied some mm-hmm. much more boring things, uh, but it felt like that was a safer, a safer pathway back then. 
Makes sense. Definitely. If, e- if esports or gaming was bigger, big in my days, I don't think we'd be talking today. Nowadays, you get contracts. I'm in San Francisco. The Golden State Warriors, who you may or may not know the basketball uh, team. Obviously, I know the basketball team. They sign esports players all day, every day. And they're a basketball well, we, franchise. We have yeah. the same here, you know. Uh, actually, I would. <laughs> No offense to America, but Europe <laughs> was in advance when it came to esports. Korea is obviously was obviously right. you know, leading the game by far, but Europe was quite advanced, and it took some years for uh, the American team to catch up. And of course, now it's a different scale. But um, the first, I remember actually, actually, I think I I kind of retired when the first big event. Uh, was happening in the U.S. It was the CPL, uh, Cyber Professional, Cyber Athletic Professional League event in call in uh, in Dallas. I remember very well. Yeah, I must admit myself that I think uh, earlier this year, first time ever personally for me, I was watching games being played online. Games that I used to play when I was a, a younger person, uh, StarCraft, WarCraft, and I saw the you know the, the future iterations of these. And it's just a whole different ball game now. It was nothing like the gaming I've played before. And it was interesting watching gaming online. And can you tell us about the industry? Because, you know, it's so big, right? It's bigger than movies and, and sports combined. Am I correct? And how's that translating to, um, you know, either Web3 or, or you know, how, how is it today? I mean, the games industry in general, as you just said, is massive, right? Today, it's uh, it's bigger than the, the music and the movie industry combined. And I said today, but it's been like that for several years already. Um, so it's by far the first, the leading entertainment industry in the world. Um, wow. It, it's not something that we need to prove anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. What is interesting is, of course, the massive gap that you have today between the Web3 gaming world and the traditional gaming world. You know, when just to uh, maybe to, to give uh, uh, two numbers, we're talking about over 3 billion players, but mm-hmm. probably a little bit over 3 million crypto gamers. So we have a long way to go to to fill in this gap. Um, so many different reasons that explain this, and and I think a very clear way to get there. Really? What, what's the clear way? Are you allowed to share that with us? Yeah, for sure. L- l- listen, the... And uh, I'm very lucky because I, I, I get the opportunity, I get invited to talk about this very often at different kind of conferences. I, I think that beyond the fact that, of course, we want to improve the user experience, the user journey for uh, in, in Web3, you know, signing transaction, opening a wallet, managing with your seed phrase, all these things that are very, uh, that turn people very anxious. Mm-hmm. And because and the second thing, which is yeah, we need to educate a bit more people, uh, you know, a bit, a bit better our community and facilitate all this onboarding. I think that the first thing that we need to do is to bring high quality experiences. Yeah. And the the reason why I'm saying this is because I actually watched this movie already. It was exactly the same with the rise of free to play back then. So. Mm-hmm. Um, we go back 20 2011 um and i am here traveling the world meeting with all the ubisoft development teams to promote this new type of business model these new it's more than a business model it was an operational model we are going from fire and forget to Mm -hmm. operating our our games as services Um, so of course this also comes with you know new constraints but new benefits especially on the revenue side I was always welcome with tomatoes everywhere. You know, developers were like, "Why are we going to charge more con- for more for a game that they already paid sixty bucks?" And, and and of course, that was a very legit concern, and especially because at the time, free-to-play games were quite average. There were a lot of a- games coming from Asia that were copycat or like you know, uh, I would say cheap copycats of successful Western franchises. But over time, things changed. And I would say it took two players, two massive games that, you, of course, you know about. Supercell mm-hmm. with Clash of Clans on mobile mm-hmm. and Riot Games with League of Legends. And yeah. when these two games came out, then all of a sudden, people stopped caring about the business model. They just wanted to mm-hmm. play these games. And then eventually, they got quite acquainted with this new type of operation and business model where... Yeah, it's free to play, and it doesn't mean that there's a downgrade in the quality. So, mm-hmm. this is what I think we need to where we need to get now um, in in the Web three gaming world. But we have to understand, building quality games 
is a very long process. Mm-hmm. You know, building Assassin's Creed, building games like The Division, takes really many, many years to get there. So, of course, you know, considering how young is our industry, is our, uh, you know, Web3 gaming industry, well, it's coming. And you start seeing them, right? You start seeing Shrapnel, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, th- these projects, Star Atlas, Illuvium now, you know, improving their quality. I want to say, look at Life Beyond. We yeah. started as something that looked very, uh, uh, f- like, cartoony. We upgraded, upgraded, upgraded. In the next few months, we have a massive art direction overhaul now that we finally finally have the financial capacity to go AAA. It's going to be mind-blowing. And we're mm-hmm. going to be at the standard of quality that you can find in the traditional gaming world. And you'll start seeing this adoption coming. Not before. So mm-hmm. even if you you know make it super seamless, super easy to start a world, you know, to to have a wallet, to log in, in these games, but that the quality of the experience is is low, mm-hmm. you won't get mass adoption. Got it. You definitely seem to know you know how to build games with your experience and background and, and the and the time frame it takes to build these IPs. So I definitely want to learn more about the Life Beyond game. Personally, because I, I used to love game. I don't know what happened. I got old. <laughs> uh, but I think what a, a lot of what happened to a lot of people, they started moving into mobile game, like you mentioned, Clash yeah. of Clans. Um, and, and League of Legends is more of a PC game. But yeah, tell us about the Life Beyond game. Like, what's the demo? Who are we targeting? Is it mobile? Is it on PC? Will it be on consoles one day? Am I even asking the right question here? <laughs> Listen, you... Your question makes sense because this is the natural way to start. But you'll say that it, we're, we're, we're in a way we're not a game. We're much more than a game. Okay. Um, Life Beyond is I. I'm going to introduce it differently. I think we're at a turning point in our future. We can choose to uh, explore. You know. Uh, push the boundaries of our physical world and explore beyond uh, the limit of our f- physical world, our solar system. And, you know, this is what we, uh, we, we're, st- we're starting again to do. Or we can uh, push the limit, the human's limitation through digital t- technology, kind of transcending these human limitations. Mm. So we ask ourselves the question, what if there is a world, what if there's a place where we could do both of that? where we could enjoy both parts of this vision. Uh, a, a realm where we could achieve anything and become anyone. Hmm. Well, this is what Life Beyond is about. Picture yourself in Life Beyond, uh, in you know, venturing in this new world, uh, where you can be a, an, an architect, an interstellar architect, building happy tasks and dollars or massive buildings over there. Or you can be an engineer pushing the boundaries of technology, or even a visionary politician shaping the laws, shaping the Mm. culture of this new frontier. And even though it will take the form of a game, your action and their outcome are very real because of ERC-20 token, because of NFTs. So, you know, it's like, it looks like an MMORPG, Mm -hmm. but it's so much more. So, yeah, you're right asking the right question, but as you see, my answer is not just, oh, it's an action-adventure game. It's a game mm-hmm. that has multiple loops inside uh, where you will be, get an opportunity to kind of grow as a human. You know, maybe you're like, oh, uh, I don't know about you, but maybe, you know, you were one day fantasizing, oh, maybe I'd like to be a farmer. You know, mm-hmm. what if, what is this life? But... You're not necessarily willing to take the real life risks. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's a big choice, it's a big decision, it's a big move. So what if you can experience this in an online mm-hmm. world? But with real stakes, right? Because your time is put to you know, is contributing to generate some value, some in game value that can actually be turned into tangible wealth in a way. And now, ex- now think of this example, but expand it to so many different li- real life scenarios, like running a business, mm-hmm. you know, becoming a vehicle, an automotive engineer. This is what we're developing. Wow, that is mind blowing because I'm just thinking of the implications of myself, for example, just trying different fields of interest of mine and not have to deal with 
you know, social blow, blowback or just, you know, just more mental than anything. Yeah, and exactly. It, yeah. Like, I think, but, you know, I, I think when you start your own company, you're always chasing something that is a little bit more than, oh, I'm just going to do a business, you know, I'm just going to make some money because, I mean, especially when you're, you know, you have the chance like me as, uh, as I, ha I was, you have like a, you know, an executive position on big projects and stuff. You need something, I think you need something more and you're chasing something bigger. And for us, that was really, and actually, to be honest, it was all very nurtured at Ubisoft. Ubisoft was always obsessed with enriching people's life. Mm. Uh, so, you know, when you, you might think, oh, Assassin's Creed, you spend your whole game session murdering people, <laughs> how does it really enrich your life? Well, there's one aside that is, is very interesting in, in Assassin's Creed, which is you are using history as your playground. Mm -hmm. We are using history as the playground. Any in, uh, any Assassin's Creed iteration takes place in a real historical time period mm -hmm. where we get you to interact with real historical characters. We always had historians involved in the project, in the projects, and so yeah, you might not realize, but you were learning of stuff because you were exposed to a real thing. So that was in a form of an educational experience. So, you know, kind of carrying on this fantasy uh, or this uh, this goal in life, of course, with life beyond, sometimes we like to call it a personal development platform. We think there's like a human mm. scaling system in it where we're yeah. not going to teach you how to be an architect. Let's be reasonable. But we can help you to start experiencing what it feels like mm -hmm. to be, you know, because if you're an architect, especially in our, you know, in, in today's world where we're in, in in a free market economy, well, you need to find clients. Um, you know, you need to source products, source resources. Like, well, you can do that in this world, but we're always ad addressing it in with the angle of gameplay, mm -hmm. because, and especially in our modern society, where the truth is, we're very lucky because. I assume you and I were not really concerned about our having a shelter over our head, um, having food on the table, because we go to the supermarket and we can find some food and, you know, we have a job. And so, so we're more interested in things that kind of make us happy rather than make us survive. Mm -hmm. So all of these different concepts are really mixed into Life Beyond. Um, it again will take the form as a game, and over time, as you get into deeper into the experience, you start growing as a as, as a human being. That is very interesting. That you know the self development part of Ubisoft and also yourself with Life Beyond. Uh, even in the name itself, you know Life Beyond it is it uh, has that effect. Ah, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> as a CEO, I mean the industry moves at a lightning speed. Probably in gaming, but even more so in Web three. Web three is worse, ten times worse. It's, yeah, <laughs> right. You're, as a CEO, you're trying to keep you know the wheels on and keep the car in the track. I mean, how do you do that with all these new things coming up, dynamic NFTs, AI, and we talked about you know Apple throwing in their headset. Tell us, you know, how do you do? You are you keep uh, do you keep pivoting, or, or is there just a north star? So. You know, there's obviously not an answer that is black and black or white. Um, everything is about balance. the The reality is that first, you know, in the startup world, you learn very quickly that you need to have a vision, but at the same time, you need to be agile. You know, you need to be lean. You need to be able to iterate, and the market and the the your environment is changing. In Web three, it's a different. It's on a different <laughs> scale. You know, it's like you. You think of a pl you, you see a collection doing something and you're like wow, so smart, you know I want to <laughs> do this or I want to what agency work with these guys, you know and then you're like you you want to secure all of their partners because you think oh I got a playbook here for success, mm -hmm. but within three months this playbook is completely outdated, right. so it's quite interesting because it tells it teaches you a few things. The first one is you can't just rely on no on uh, knowledge, you have to rely on skills. So it's not just because you know how these guys did, you know, it's because 
you you could learn, you could extract what was interesting from that from these past experiences, and grow on your own skills so that you can navigate better with the future opportunities and the future changes. The second thing is, of course, that you can't fall into every trend right now, and you need mm-hmm. to be a bit sustain, like a, a bit stable. I mean, one easy one for me is, you know, people start to demonize metaverse. You know. Right. Uh, they were like, "Oh, metaverse is over now. Everybody's back on Gen is on Gen AI, and that's all that matters." You know, and so many memes and uh, so many so many uh, members of you know the usual like community just saying, "Don't use metaverse anymore." You know, metaverse is a joke. And then Apple releases their, it's, uh, you know, announces, reveals the Vision Pro. And now mm-hmm. you can see, keep reading article about the metaverse is not dead. The metaverse is back, you know. And <laughs> so, yeah, I was always saying, especially in this in this example, I kept using the word metaverse. And if you listen to Yatsu, uh, you know, our, our, our chairman, uh, Danny Mocha Brands, he never stopped using the metaverse. Because mm-hmm. we all obviously have some core beliefs. So... You know, it's. I'm sure you've seen this chart, you know, about entrepreneurship and where it's like what you think it's going to be and what it is, you know, and so you think it's going to be a straight line going mm-hmm. up and a, it's a very rocky journey. It is. So uh, having your North Star matters, um, but you need to be flexible. Uh, you need to be agile. Like Bruce Lee was saying, you know, you need to be like water, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, to be able to also absorb all of these ma- massive changes. And this is a little bit what happened to us. We were not originally a blockchain-based project. We hmm. started as a Web2 game, but a Web2 game that was designed from the get-go for ownership. Mm-hmm. So, you know, eventually we discovered blockchain and the interest of composability, um, you know, like trustless resolutions of contract, permissionless interactions with third party in your experience. And we're like, okay, that's a fantastic opportunity. But at first, there was no blockchain in the value proposition of life beyond. Yeah, definitely. Like you mentioned, metaverse, not going anywhere. We know Animoca had a, or still has a billion dollar metaverse fund as publicly announced. And, you know, with with the Apple launch of the metaverse, it just got more exciting, it would seem, you know, to participate in the metaverse. Uh, there's so much applications, you know, of where gaming bleeds into real life, like you mentioned. Uh, what's next? So what is the game launching in beta? Is there going to be an NFT launch of sorts? Um, oh. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, the bear market is a great opportunity because mm-hmm. you feel less peer pressure from your uh, ecosystem to push stuff and release stuff constantly, um, to, you know, and so you can build. But we are absolutely not interested to build behind closed doors. Mm. I think we have one trauma as AAA developers is spending many years on a project with absolutely no clue knowing if it's going to be successful or not. Mm. And I think that this is what brings us together here. No one wants to experience that again. You know, We don't want to be in this dark room for so long. So instead, we had a very interesting approach, which is to keep releasing stuff. You know, like an open, it's like an open kitchen restaurant. You know, where you see mm-hmm. what's going, you see what we're cooking. Um, you have to accept that when you look at it, it might not be ready, might not be cooked, but you can mm-hmm. look at it, you can even try it, and you provide feedback. So right now, if you're uh, interact with the Life Beyond community, you can participate uh, to a contest with our tr- combat simulator, so you can try our combat system. So we gamify the whole thing, we put some rewards, so of course we also create a, a great layer of, in, of incentive of intra- for you to interact with it. Mm-hmm. But our agenda here is to collect all of this really great feedback um, so that we can get the experience better. And we're going to keep doing this probably until the end of the year um, and 2024 will be the year where we'll really start focusing on getting on our road ma- road to beta, certainly. Awesome. Well, definitely something that, that the listeners should definitely dive into. Um, I myself uh, would love to experience these new 
versions of games that I used to love and enjoy. I used to love and enjoy RPG games, so M O R RPG game is definitely of interest to me. And I see it everywhere in social that you know the metaverse is absolutely not dead. Everyone, or I, I was, I would say that a lot of people have integrated gaming into their life in in a bigger way than I've ever seen before. People have growing up, I I never saw gaming rooms, and I think you see on social and everything everywhere else out there that. There's these gaming rooms that, you know, husbands or even wives create for themselves. That's like their own metaverse. And it's very interesting. It's a deep part of people's lives. It was for myself. And I would definitely want to find that joy again, <laughs> you know, in adulthood. Because now that it's funny, because, you know, when you're young, you're like, oh, if I had the money, I, I'm going to buy everything. I'm going to buy all the games, buy everything. And it's funny. I have all the money now to purchase any game I want, but I haven't haven't done that. Uh, would love to find that joy because I, I but, definitely love gaming. And it also has to do with uh, you know the fact that we need to be more ubiquitous in the in the way uh, or more versatile in the way we experience gaming. So of course it needs to run here and it's to run on your laptop and it's to be able to run on your on your PlayStation. That's what we're working on. Um, Life Beyond is. Un- powered by Unreal Engine 5, which is an engine that can run anywhere. Now, the point is to be able to uh, f- go get over the performance constraints of each device. And we're building some really key cast technology for this. Awesome. I love to end it, every podcast with this because, like we mentioned, Web3 moves so fast of all the, all the technology coming out. Uh, especially in the gaming vertical. It's so, I wouldn't say uh, advanced technological, but it's a niche that within NFTs, uh, besides Shrapnel, you're the only other gaming platform that I've interviewed. Uh, embarrassed to say that because gaming has really led the 2023 trend in terms of you know um, crypto and in terms of NFTs at least. So is there any questions that I should have asked, but I didn't? And also kind of what's next for you guys? Yeah, I mean, maybe what's the difference, like how it's going to improve, you know? What is the value of Web3 for gaming? Uh, because we we kind of take for granted in this conversation that there is one and that we should mm-hmm. bring you know, these games on the blockchain. So that's the question that I, that, uh, that I would ask. Yeah, let, let's ask it. I think you touched you on it briefly. You, brief. you want the answer? <laughs> yeah, it might be simple. <laughs> so to me, it's, it's extremely powerful. There, you know, Web3 is uh, obviously about ownership, and this radically changes the relationship that gamers are going to entertain with their games. The fact that now, as a player, you really become a stakeholder of the project mm-hmm. because you own the assets that are necessary for this game to exist radically changes the way developers are also going to um, keep growing their experience in a way game as a service was an unhealthy model because we went from oh we're giving access to everybody to Mm -hmm. discovering that it's actually very much a business model of whales and so that means Mm -hmm. i need to bring a lot of whales as much as possible uh and i but of course there aren't that many so this small group i'm going to squeeze them you know and to earn revenue Mm-hmm. this way i think this is a uh, something that we don't have to do anymore with mm-hmm. with uh, with web3 it's again it's a model where we're not chasing necessarily volumes because all we care about is having people that are really engaged i mean board ape <laughs> at <laughs> maxim at more at max would have 10,000 unique holders it's mm-hmm. not even the case but it would be 10,000 unique holders right <laughs> And it still doesn't prevent to build, to get a very healthy business, you know, very healthy uh, business case here. So, as a player, you as a developer, you create something that is much healthier for your community. As a member of this community, you're now actively participating to the journey of this project, and you, in the kind of uh, uh, you know relationship the balance it's the the weight is way balanced way more balanced than before you own the assets that the game need to run mm-hmm. if and so the game serves the assets and you hold the assets so the game serves the players so to me it's i will never go back it's a much healthier mm-hmm. model um, and so as a player 
you will get all the benefits. I think ju wow. just the reason why people are so, were so negative was like because they were like, okay, but to play what? To play these games? Can like, I don't care about owning this if it's for that. Once you get World of Warcraft and you know League of Legends, you know, and all of these and Call of Duty and but you can own the asset that are inside. You'll see. Massive revolution. Yeah. I, I'm what you just said there, I'm scared. And for the average listener out there who's, you know, investing in NFTs like myself, uh, I'm scared because I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna be more addicted than before. <laughs> Only because of my experience with NFTs. Like I love everything that I've purchased that much more because of a shared stakeholder model, just like you mentioned, whether it be Starbucks NFTs or the NBA NFTs that I have or you know any NFT that I own, I feel a connection with them like but I've never no felt reason before. To be scared because <laughs> because be, the, the whole point is that you will be able to get rid of them. You know, if you if you want to be out, like the fact mm. that today, especially when you play a free to play game, your process, you know, your decision to purchase much more because you know you're stuck with it after. Mm -hmm. But here. Potentially, it can be way more. It's way more liquid. You know, you can you can just trade it and move on right. to something else. Also, if I may, we only we only end up talking about buying NFTs, but there are so many other ways to end up owning NFTs, and mostly by participating. This is also a new uh, layer that we need, that we're going to experience more in the coming years you know where of course at first it started with like monetization but it doesn't have to be um in life beyond you will have so many ways to own nfts that you can have you know assets that you can have crafted that resources that right. you might have collected somewhere you won't necessarily have had to spend any dollar it can also be that you spent time right that's what I'm afraid of the time. It would be so, I enjoyed so much that I'm gonna spend so much more time because I feel that much more connected to it. And you know, that's exciting for people who love, you know, the, the activities that they participate in. So that's what I'm sharing, but absolutely. I see your vision. I, f I feel it already personally. And that's why I'm gonna temper my expectations. You know, when I get in the game, I might just be there all the time and the wife might just absolutely hate me. <laughs> but Benjamin, it's been amazing having you on. I'll put all the links down for Life Beyond down below. We'd love to have you back on because, you know, like we mentioned, the, the landscape moves so fast that I'm sure we'll have a much different conversation just a few weeks from now, sure. actually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Benjamin. You have a great day. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you all.